thanks for coming, Julia. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to speak on this important subject. You've already said, uh, I think, the most important biographical facts about myself. Uh, I would just like to add for transparency's sake that I am nowadays also uh, a board member of the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Germany, which is also working on this subject of funding uh, open source technology. Um, so today, however, I am representing myself as a, a private person uh, who is passionate about uh, free software. And already when I was a member of the European Parliament, I was trying to convince governments to take um, free and open source software more seriously as a matter of public policy. And uh, today, I want to give you an update on um, my thinking on this and also some of the work that I've been doing with other free software policy activists in order to make more public funding for open source technology a reality in Europe. So I want to start with a pretty, I would say, high level of observation about what government actually is and what, what its purpose is. So like on a very idealized, uh, very high level view, the government is supposed to be all of us. So it's uh, representing the entire population and trying to serve all of the population and be accountable to it. And uh, one very important function that government provides for its population is to uh, provide, to build and to maintain infrastructure. And in the past, this was mostly sort of thought of as uh, uh, maintaining roads or making sure that there is a fire service and uh, other public services like that. But I think more and more software has become uh, such an infrastructure for public life. And we are seeing this really more than ever during the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, I was looking at this slide uh, that I have used before, and it very much looks like a scene from a different world uh, now that we are in lockdown and our daily lives, all parts of it, education, etc., have really become more and more mediated by technology. And um, I think that the government should therefore have a free software philosophy at its heart, which is to use free software to take responsibility for it and also to contribute to the development of free and open source software because it really forms part of the backbone of public service uh, that governments are responsible for. Um, it's quite, sh quite certain, I think, also that nowadays in this very technologically mediated society, those who build the technology have a lot of power. And uh, this phrase, algorithms rule the world, is maybe a little bit cheeky in the sense that uh, it sounds uh, sort of like some of these really um, sens sensational headlines that are trying to pretend that software is magic. And this is not what I'm trying to say with this. So I'm not saying, you know, algorithms are, are scary and therefore we should ban them or anything like that, which is popular with some politicians, but rather in the sense that um, computers are no longer limited to particular parts of our lives, but instead all of our society is mediated by technology. And, um, this is leading sometimes to some really fun and weird problems like, uh, you know, uh, this Twitter account, Internet of Shit, is uh, um, collecting sort of funny problems, funny bugs with uh, the Internet of Things where you could have uh, a blue screen of death on a fridge, which is maybe not like the greatest uh, utopian scenario. So um, nowadays, of course, uh, with the coronavirus, this has become uh, even more obvious because uh, all of a sudden we had to improvise digital solutions for a lot of things that we used to do physically. And at the center of the discussion has sort of been Zoom and whether it's a good idea that everybody is using this proprietary software. Um, but because it was a crisis, uh, when the first lockdown started a year ago, the sort of normative uh, power of having something that works um, out of the box sort of took over. But um, I think one year into the crisis, we should no longer take this uh, uh, excuse 
that we were in a crisis situation and instead really ask our governments to um, also help support and provide open source alternatives that have the same sort of backbone power uh, that a proprietary software like Zoom can provide and also the same uh, usability um, which also is, you know, needs to be developed, needs to be tested and can be quite expensive and everybody benefits from it being there, but not everybody feels responsible uh, to contribute to it and to pay for it. The same is true in other parts of society like schools, businesses and even the public administrations themselves. Like uh, I come from Germany and German public administration has been very reluctant to digitizing a lot of its services for a long time, but now that a lot of public services had to close their physical spaces, it's really become so urgent that they have to seriously deal with these questions. So quite often um, we end up using improvised proprietary solutions that actually conflict with our own data security and data protection standards. So um, I think we've established uh, at this point that yeah, software is playing this increasingly important role in our society. And then the question is, okay, what should be the government's role in it? Um, I think it would be somewhat dangerous if government was centrally controlling open source software projects, because of course, um, the permissionless innovation and the, the possibility that really everybody can participate uh, in free software projects um, without some sort of central control and uh, planning is really what has made free software so successful. So I think it's really more about creating the um, awareness within governments that they are already relying on free and open source software every day, whether they are aware of it or not. Because quite often, uh, politicians' understanding of software is very much focused on the application layer only, and they don't know all the software libraries or the server infrastructure that is run on open source, even in their own institutions. So my goal is that uh, governments realize this better and uh, start taking more responsibility um, to actually support the security and safety of their own IT infrastructures, but by that also start contributing more to the overall uh, software ecosystem. Um, there is a very, I think, somewhat dangerous debate going on at the moment in Europe about digital sovereignty um, that is sort of trying to frame the dependence on proprietary software as a nationalist issue. And I don't really like this framing because for me, the point is not that uh, you know Amazon or Microsoft are American companies, but I think the problem is really more that um, if uh, the uh, open source software that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis is not accessible to uh, security audits and to modification that actually suits our needs. So I think... Um, we should not promote this idea of digital sovereignty as sort of trying to separate the internet and digital technology into different geopolitical spheres. Actually, that is an idea that uh, China and Russia have been promoting uh, in the past uh, at, for example, international uh, internet governance discussions that basically the internet should not be a global medium. I think we should actually take this discussion around digital sovereignty in a different direction. So the kind of digital sovereignty that makes sense to me is to say, okay, if we have a lot of free and open source software that provides the basic infrastructure that a state needs to function and that the economy and the educational system needs to function, then we become less uh, dependent on a single government or on a single company, regardless of which country that company is from or whether it's a multinational. So digital sovereignty can actually be uh, interconnectedness and decentralization instead of trying to sort of lock ourselves up uh, off from the rest of the world. I don't really care if software is made in Germany as long as it is made open source. And so I think it's important to kind of instill this thinking also in public administrations to sort of go away from only funding companies that sort of immediately and directly contribute to the economic growth of that particular country and instead also look at uh, what is the basis for all of that uh, economic growth, what is the uh, free 
infrastructure that at the end of the day benefits all of us because I don't think that global politics is a zero-sum game where we can only benefit if somebody else is losing out. So um, I think this idea of sort of digital sovereignty as uh, embodying decentralization, connectedness, and permiss permissionless innovation is actually pretty well um, established in one already existing US-based uh, open source funding program, the Open Technology Fund. So uh, this is a pretty good program that uh, we all benefit from, even though it's paid for by the US government, but it is not run by the US government. It's run by an independent NGO that has been receiving public funding from Congress in order to uh, promote primarily anti-censorship technologies. So they have funded things like Signal or Tor or WireGuard. So also privacy technologies that help democracy activists, independent journalists around the world um, in countries such as uh, Belarus or Hong Kong or Iran to stand up to authoritarian governments. And so, of course, this has been sort of in the interest of the US government as well, but uh, nobody is stopping the uh, you know activists in other countries that may not be aligned with U.S. policy from using those open source technologies precisely because they are open source. And so I'm sure that a lot of the developers who have uh, received public funding from the Open Technology Fund do not agree with the uh, U.S. government's policies at all. I mean, uh, just look at sort of the surveillance programs at the of the U.S., but because there is a separation between it where money is coming from the public sector, but the organization of the funding is done by civil society, this is why people can trust these kinds of projects. And so I think it's a good model um, that we should learn from. So the problem, though, uh, that was uh, exposed with the Open Technology Fund is that last year um, this project was under extreme threat because there was a single point of failure because basically if you only have this one project that lots and lots of uh, open source technology projects rely on this one funding source then a single uh, authoritarian regime can also try to shut it down and this is actually something that was attempted by the trump administration last year so um President Trump appointed one of his allies to the U.S. Agency for Global Media, um, who fired executives from the Open Technology Fund, uh, froze its funding, and uh, also even tried to get the OTF permanently banned from receiving U.S. funding, even after uh, he would leave office. Now, unfortunate, uh, let's say fortunately, this attack on the Open Technology Fund was not successful because they actually had support from both parties in Congress and were able to um, protect it from, um, from this attack. And now under the Biden administration, it's pretty clear that the Open Technology Fund will be able to continue. But I think what this means for us European is that uh, we are not very digitally sovereign if uh, basically a single government somewhere else in the world can go uh, down an authoritarian route and suddenly the free software that we all have been relying on for our privacy, for circumventing censorship technologies is suddenly not funded anymore. So in a way, I feel like the EU has been coasting on the benefits of the Open Technology Fund without actually contributing to it. And I think this is something that should change because um, if there are more pro uh, projects like the Open Technology Fund that maybe focus on different types of open source technologies, not just on sort of privacy technologies in particular, um, then it's also less damaging if a single one of them loses its funding or has to uh, reduce its operation for a particular time. Because I think one thing that is really important and that has not been um, paid attention to enough is the maintenance of uh, free and open source software projects, which is not as sexy as saying, okay, I'm inventing something entirely new, but the maintenance is just as important. So where are we in the European Union? Um, there are some funding infrastructures in individual member states, such as the Netherlands 
and also to a certain extent at the European Union level. And I'm mostly going to talk about the EU because I was involved with that and also uh, with Germany because this is the country where I'm from. But uh, there are also other um, very interesting and exciting projects in other member states uh, that I think we should share information about. So. The European Commission is really uncomfortable with its own reliance on proprietary technology. So, for example, when the, the lockdown started, um, the European Commission was criticizing um, the security of Zoom, but at the same time still using it for some of its own meetings, um, well, because it simply worked. So um, I think we need to push the European Commission to actually put its money where its mouth is. And it already has an open source strategy, so that's good. It uh, has committed to releasing um, more of its in-house software as open source. And I think that's a really good development, but we should, should sort of push them to also fund open source projects more generally. So. Um, when I was in the European Parliament uh, in 2014, this was the first year I was in Parliament, the Heartbleed and Shellshook uh, vulnerabilities were um, discovered. And they, I think, demonstrated that uh, open source software and open source infrastructure is really implemented all over the place. And quite often, we're not aware, aware of it. And even though uh, free and open source software has a lot of um, uh, benefits in terms of security and reliability, it's not enough to just make something open source. You also have to make sure that there is um, funding available and an infrastructure available to make sure that the software can be maintained and audited. So um, as sort of a learning from Heartbleed, I was able to convince the European Commission with a few of my colleagues uh, to start the free and open source software auditing project, um, where the goal was basically to pay for the audit of uh, free software applications that were used inside the European Commission, and then to release those uh, the results of those audits and hopefully bug fixes back into those projects. And um, well, I think we learned a lot in the process of doing this pilot project because the European Commission had never done something like this before. And we ran into quite a lot of um, problems and then sort of tried to iteratively, iteratively improve this project. So in the beginning, um, there was basically the approach of uh, contracting this uh, security audit out to a company. So there was a public tender and we realized that basically the, the companies or the individuals that are best placed to actually improve free and open source software are not usually the companies that are best placed to win European Union public tenders because this is just a different sort of skill set. There is a lot of bureaucracy involved and there is a high risk that you end up with a consultancy that produces a lot of reports, writes a lot of things, but doesn't actually write a lot of code. And so um, in order to fix this problem, we eventually changed the EU FOSA program into a bug bounty program, which was also criticized by some people because bug bounties um, can also create sort of um, not ideal incentives because bug bounties basically are paid out for finding a bug, but then there is still the problem who is doing the actual work of fixing the bug. And um, even though the EU FOSA has finished by now and it has, I think, found some quite serious flaws, uh, for example, in PuTTY that were uh, uh, fixed as a consequence of it. And generally the response from the free software community to FOSA was quite good. Um, this project has now wrapped up and is being continued in a slightly different form as part of uh, the European Commission's ISA Square program. So in ISA Square, the European Commission is actually trying to pay for the fixing of bugs, which I think is a good sort of next step approach. So they have um, partnered up with Integrity and um, are basically paying a 20% bonus for uh, bug bounties that um, uh, are released in the context of, uh, context of the matrix.org program um, for encrypted and decentralized communication. So if you don't just find the vulnerability, but also provide a fix, 
you get this 20% bonus. And this is actually a program that is running right now and that people can participate in. Um, at the U at German level, we have the prototype fund, which is also um, funded by uh, German government ministry, but is uh, run by civil society. And I think this is really the best approach to make sure that um, free software developers have an easy time actually applying for funding. So the prototype fund um, is also a project of the Open Knowledge Foundation, um, where I'm a board member, and uh, it's directly funding free software um, and also helps projects with the bureaucracy uh, around that. So um, the problem, though, is that because of the limits that are put on the funding by the German government, the prototype fund can only fund prototypes. So it's about funding innovation. It's about starting off a new project, which can be pretty important. Um, but it, what is missing is a funding structure for the maintenance of open source infrastructure. Uh, I really like this XKCD pro, uh, comic because I think it illustrates the problem very well. So um, it's kind of a, a stack of building bricks that says all modern digital infrastructure. And then at the very bottom, there is a tiny piece that says a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. Now, this person in Nebraska would not be able to apply to a lot of the existing funding pro programs for open source software because it's not innovative. It's not, you know, developing a prototype. It's sort of boring. It's maintaining something that everybody relies on, but most politicians have never heard of. And this is, I think, the funding structure that is missing and that we should have in the European Union. So um, together with uh, some activist friends from different organizations, both from the Prototype Fund, but also from the Open Technology Fund, I've started sort of conceptualizing what such a digital infrastructure fund could look like, and also trying to start to talk to government officials in the German government and also in the European Commission about how we can make this a reality. So we have come up with a few principles that would be really important for this fund to work. First of all, um, we should learn from the lessons of the FOSA program and the prototype fund. So it must be really easy to apply to. This was not the case in the beginning of FOSA. It sort of became better throughout the bug bounty process, but it's also something that the prototype fund is really good at, that the entry barrier is low. And even if you're not a company, if you, even if you're like an individual person, uh, you should be able to apply for funding for your free software project. Um, there has to be very low overhead, so you should not basically have reports written by consultancies and things like this, but the majority of the funding should go directly to the project. Um, it must not be limited to innovative projects, so we have to convince governments that it's worth funding the maintenance and improvement of infrastructure rather than just funding innovation. Because at the end of the day, new innovation is going to build on top of that. And so it is going to pay off for the economy at large. But we have to focus on sustainability and making sure that um, basically if this one building block in the XKCD comic is pulled out, uh, that the whole uh, infrastructure doesn't just crumble. Um, also, I think it's really important that this funding program has to be part of a broader free software and also free hardware strategy of government, where they also pay attention to other issues that arrive, such as um, uh, chip manufacturing and other issues that may affect our ability to sort of be digitally sovereign, to, to stay in their own um, vernacular. We also want to learn from the Open Technology Fund, and uh, we are in talks with them. And uh, the great thing about the Open Technology Fund is that it actually wants to be copied. Um, the entire, basically, operational infrastructure of how the OTF distributes funding is open source itself. So um, we are able to, to basically take all the le lessons that they have learned in their operation and build a European project that is inspired by it, but maybe is funding slightly different projects. 
So from the OTF, I think we have learned how important it is that this um, funding structure must not be directly run by the government. It's okay if money is coming from the public hand. I think that's the job of the public administration. But at the same time, I think a lot of developers are rightfully suspicious of go government oversight. And so that should not be part of this funding structure. Also, there should be no expectation of promoting the government in exchange for receiving this funding. You're receiving the funding because this is something that is helpful to society at large and not because the government wants to have uh, good publicity. It must be built also on a network of trusted actors. So the open source community is not just sort of a, a business community or something like that. It's a culture where people know each other and trust individual people that they have worked with over years. And so whoever runs such a fund has to be part of the free software community to actually have these personal connections and be able to build this trust. There should also be no restrictions on the nationality of the people who can apply. And this is something that's actually pretty difficult to convince governments of that, you know, the German economy will grow if we give money to some developer in Brazil who is maintaining and improving infrastructure that is open source. I think to me, this is totally logical, but to a lot of governments, it's not. Um, yeah, and obviously there is no competition between the Open Technology Fund, which is now thankfully continuing under the Biden administration, and these, this new European fund that we're hoping to build, because basically um, we want to have decentralized and redundant funding infrastructure. So if one of them, for example, shrinks, the other can take it off. So uh, uh, take, take it up. So I think the crisis with the Open Technology Fund last year has demonstrated that it's good for all of us to have a diverse funding infrastructure that can talk to each other, that can help each other, and that can maybe also specialize in slightly different fields. So um, I think uh, that obviously the core of the free software community are the people who are building the software. I'm not a software developer actually. And I think what I can contribute to the overall ecosystem is to build a bridge between the free software community and um, public policy because well, most people in government are also not free software developers. So I think it's great if you continue to do the coding and I'll try to focus on telling the story behind it, why this is something that politicians should care about. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to do that with like-minded activists from the other uh, organizations that I've mentioned, such as the Prototype Fund, the Open Technology Fund, and also in individual people in the European Commission or uh, in governments who really want to push um, this open source strategy forward. Um, so we will try together to make something like a European Digital Infrastructure Fund or Basic Technology Fund a reality in the next couple of years. But what is the most important to us is to insist that these design features that we think are needed are actually put in place. So this means not a focus on like which country you're from and which tax ID you have, not a focus on um, things like whether you're a big business or an individual developer, but what should really count is are you building something that is relevant for uh, the public infrastructure and is it released as open source and is it auditable? That is really at the core of what we should be funding. So um, the goal ultimately is to have EU or global funding structures, but we don't want to wait for you know, 27 member state governments to, to come together and to agree on something with the European Parliament. But sometimes it's actually easier to start something in one country. And then if it's successful, other countries may join it. Um, this has actually recently happened with uh, the Gaia X project for open cloud infrastructure, which was started in Germany. And then France got interested in it. And now it's sort of more of a European project. So this is kind of how we want to operate. So um, we are trying to get this off the ground in Germany. And I'm really glad uh, to have support from people within the OTF who are basically saying, well, look, everything we're doing is open source. You can copy our methodology. You can copy our 
um, our infrastructure, our own software that we're using to run this fund. But um, I think there are many important areas aside from anti-censorship and privacy technology that also need funds like the Open Technology Fund. And for me, sort of basic technologies that are not at the application layer are uh, one of the missing links that I would like to focus on. But there are also other things, I think, where this sort of funding structure is needed. So, for example, I could imagine an open technology fund for government technology, like government applications, or one for open hardware, and so on. So I think there is no shortage of areas that would benefit from this. So hopefully in a few decades, we will have 100 open technology funds um, funded by different governments and public uh, uh, sector players around the world, because I don't think that the public infrastructure that we use for everything from uh, school to work to the healthcare system is something that we should leave entirely to the responsibility of private companies. So um, yeah, what can you do to help? So at the moment, this fund does not exist yet. So that means we cannot actually take like funding applications for this or anything like this. But of course, do check out the prototype fund or the open technology fund if you are building open source software that you think might uh, fit those criteria. So for the OTF, primarily sort of anti-censorship and privacy technology, and for the prototype fund, primarily sort of new ideas, new projects that are just starting out, um, especially in Germany. And yes, please talk about this idea, write newspaper articles about why government should fund open source software. And um, if you hear your politicians talk about digital sovereignty, ask them what they actually mean by that. Like, do you actually mean that we should sort of shut ourselves off from the rest of the world? I think this is something that uh, lies in Europe's past and not in its future. Or do you actually mean that we should become more resilient by having things like open source so we become less dependent on a single technology company, for example? Um, and please also start similar initiatives in your country. Um, ask political parties to include this idea in their election programs. And please also share if there are existing projects like this in your countries that we should know about. And yeah, hopefully uh, in, not, in not too distant future, we will be able to share good news about this project going ahead in Germany. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is where you can reach me at Zenfalken on Twitter or at julia.reda at okfn.de. And yeah, I look very much forward to discussing more of this in breakout or by email or on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Julia, for your talk. Um, we actually got a few questions in um, via our platform. Uh, maybe we can go few, through a few before you go over to the breakout and then people can take it further. Um, one person asked um, about the EU FOSA project. What were your what are your key learnings basically from this? Because it was the first time that was done, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the most important one is that you have to make it really easy to apply. So like the the first sort of try of FOSA where we had these, uh, this public tender, I think that didn't work very well because of uh, basically to, yeah, to win a public tender from the EU, you kind of like, you don't necessarily have to be a big company, but if you're an individual developer, like, yeah, don't even try. So at the end, what we, why we decided to do bug bounties instead was because then we could do a public tender for a bug bounty company and then basically uh, um, different bug bounty platforms could apply and they are actually able to do that. But then we were able to actually pay money to individual developers, which otherwise the EU wasn't really equipped to do. But of course, this sort of meant that we ended up using the form of funding because this was the easiest to implement and not necessarily because bug bounties are the best way to support the free software community. So in the end, we also did some other stuff like creating hackathons, which actually, like I, I was a little bit skeptical if this is useful, but in the end, actually we had some good feedback because some of those um, communities around like relatively specialized projects are really global. 
And they just never meet in person because it's quite expensive to fly people in from all over the world. So in the end, I'm I'm quite happy with with the FOSA project, even though it probably didn't change the world. And it was also much smaller than the Open Technology Fund. Like the Open Technology Fund, it gets about $20 million a year. So 15 million euros. FOSA was much small, smaller than that. It was more like 1 million euro a year or something like that. But still, I think it's important to point out that also 15 million euros is not a lot for the German government. Like they, if they decided they wanted to do that, they could do it right now. Like this is not serious money for uh, a mid-sized country. Yeah. Okay, then um, another question. Um, uh, it says funding developers has already become more common. How do you see funding for other roles like uh, UX designers, project managers, translators, and so on that are also important for um, uh, FOSS projects? Yeah, super important. I mean, um, I think the OTF is already doing a little bit of that. Like, for example, they have um, a sort of a professional training environment for improving user experience, for example. But yeah, I think it's a really good point that basically... Um, funding structures should be sort of agnostic to which part of the open source development um, the funding should go to. Like the funding should not be reserved to the coding alone because things like, uh, you know, user interface or translation is just as important for the software to be actually used in practice, um, which is, you know, uh, really important also for the acceptance of open source technology. Um, then there is another question by someone who sends a disclaimer that it's a, a, a red hatter um, and says a lot uh, fast developers are uh, employed um, and it seems like those projects seem to focus more on independent developers. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to, what is the way to address that? Yeah, I mean, I guess if uh, you're um, employed and you are really free, to basically use your work time to um, work on any free software project you want. That is great. But I think quite commonly um, free software developers who are uh, employed and who are releasing the pro products of their work as free software are still expected to work on specific problems. So I think there might be um, a bias in the kinds of open source software that um, free software developers who are employed are going to focus their attention on. And maybe it's more like developing new features that are needed for this particular company and maybe not so much maintaining stuff that is really at the core infrastructure. But again, like I'm not a, a free software developer. So if what I'm saying is totally wrong, feel free to correct <laughs> me. But I think it's important to basically step in where the market does not automatically provide for the funding that is needed. Okay, then I think a final question. Um, there are questions about having like an open source tax approach. So, um, uh, for example, 1% tax to all proprietary software sales um, and then distribute that money back into the open source ecosystem. Um, do you think this could be a feasible approach? Um, I mean, personally, I like it. I just know that a lot of politicians get very scared when you propose uh, when you propose tax increases. Like it's something that is uh, often not very popular. Uh, otherwise, we would probably have it uh, in more areas. But personally, I think this is kind of a a, a nice idea. <laughs> okay, then let's see. Uh, there's one final question, actually. Um, more on Germany, there recently has the um, uh, Sprung D, the uh, or Sprint, Sprint, I think it is. Sprint, yeah. yeah, the uh, uh, agency for Sprung Innovation for Leap Innovation. Um, how is that connected to your uh, to the funding of open source? Yeah, I think I think they are uh, really great and are really bringing some innovative thinking into the German government, and we have talked to them about this idea. Um, I think one of the restrictions that also uh, uh, Sprint is having is, again, this idea that it's just about innovation. And I think, you know, funding innovation is great. 
But I think we need to create sort of a broader understanding in the German government that in order to have innovation, you have to fund the basic technology. Like we've just learned this with the coronavirus, you know, like in order to have a new vaccine, you have to fund the basic research that gets you there. And I think the same is true um, for, for innovation in the tech, tech sector. 